maybe we can talk a little bit um, about uh, Ukraine and Russia. Maybe we can start with the Putin's peace plan. Uh, Putin uh, said that he could, that uh, basically said he wants to enter into negotiations right now. He'll they'll have a ceasefire right away if we enter negotiations and talk about drawing the line where it is now. Yeah. Um, well, I and it's pre preconditions to negotiations. That is, um, you know, withdrawal from what he regards or what the Russian government regards as Russian territories there, which is in, in addition to Crimea is the Donbass and Zaporozhye and, um, and Kherson. What about Luhansk is the region too, right? Oh, yeah. Well, actually, Luhansk is part of the Donbass. When I say that oh, okay. Donbass is a collective term for both um, Luhansk and um, Donetsk. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was it. That And that's actually not surprising. I, I, I mean, I don't think anybody should be surprised by that because they held those referenda, you know, and um, the, the, Rus the Russian government following the results of those, you know, the elections there, the Russian government formally recognized those territories as part of Russia. So it was clear to me that they were not going to give up those territories. But he just, you know, he just repeated this as a fact. And then Did also the uh, neutrality, you know, no NATO for it. But that's always been there. That's That was there from the beginning and even well before. This was the thing that they kept on trying to press. And it used to be nothing about territory. You know, that's something that has to be rem remembered. You know, that's there's all this talk about, oh, you know, they're, they're, the Russians are just trying to seize, you know, recreate the Soviet Union. They're just grabbing this land and then they're going to go after Poland or whatever. If you look at it, like the previous offers actually didn't ask for any of the Donbass or and certainly not in Zaporozhye or Kherson. It just, it was above all about neutrality, you know, no NATO for, um, for uh, Ukraine to keeping Ukraine out of NATO. That was the, the main thing. And that's been there all along. Now it's because, again, that uh, the, the previous offers were turned down, that we're now where we are. And, the, you know, and then this effort was made to go all in on a war against Russia, to damage Russia using Ukraine. Well, OK, now, you know, the, the terms have changed. You know, now Russia is going to insist on these territories. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's that's something he I think it's very significant. It doesn't surprise me what he said. I think it's like if you've been following it, this is it was clear that that's basically this was the minute. These were the minimum requirements that the Russians had for some kind of peace treaty. Um, but it's, I think it's very significant that he went ahead and said it and you know, in such a clear fashion. And I think it, you know, just know if from what I've seen of Putin, it makes me I, I believe that um, this indicates that the Russians are planning to make a major move soon. You know, I say soon, it could be a couple of weeks, maybe, maybe even, you know, a month or two from now. Um, but if you, you know, if you look in the past, it's like before the, the SMO began in the, in the months and then the weeks leading up to it, it was just the Russians were becoming increasingly explicit. They say, we, you know, we have these requirements and, um, I, you know, they were laying out what it was that they wanted and giving the other side an opportunity to um, to avoid conflict. And, you know, of course, it's, it was uh, that opportunity was missed and the, the SMO was launched. Um, and I think this is maybe something similar. You know, it's just saying, OK, look, this is where you are. You can have this now because this is I think this is the way that Putin thinks he kind of has a very legal mind. And, you know, say, you know, we have we can't go ahead and launch some major operation without first giving them the opportunity, right, to to settle this now. And I think he knows that it's almost certain that they're not going to, but it's just it's ethical, you know, in its own mind. We've got to do this. And I so I believe that's what we're seeing, and that, that we're going to see some sort of like a, a major offensive, probably. Yeah, with well, what do you think a major offensive? What do you think a major offensive would look like? Well, um, you know, they talked about there seems to be a there's still a lot of forces north of Kharkov and Sumy that have not been committed. So it could be just a major expansion of the offensive there. This What they did was actually quite limited. They only, you know, used a small percentage of the forces, but there's supposed to be a lot of forces like right uh, um, across the border from Sumy. 
and Sumi actually is kind of it's on the way to Kiev so it could even be a drive towards Kiev that's possible but I don't know and then of course there you know it, it, but it could be just sort of like a, a just a general uh, uptick in tempo and you know uh, in, um, all all along the front we'll see mm-hmm. Yeah, there was another uh, Russian spokesperson, the, the name sp- slips my mind, but basically saying that this was the West's last chance. Yeah. Um, the next step is going to be total surrender, complete capitulation from Russia. Right. I think that, yeah, I think there, again, there seem to be really kind of announcing, you know, that, that something's up, you know, we're giving you an opportunity to, you know, to settle things now, to avoid what's coming. Um but of course, you know, the West is going to ignore it. Now, do you think uh, the West will respond to this major offensive that is likely to come? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Um, yeah, that's that's clearly you know, the panic the, hysteria, you know. But right, the, the <laughs> right decision is to to is to sit down and negotiate, you know, work right. on it, and then you get you can stop the killing, and we can right. work towards peace. Right. You know, so, I mean, that's clearly the best option available. But like you said, we just seem to be incapable uh, of, yeah. of negotiating. Um, it's just not in our DNA anymore. Um, so yeah. that's, well, again, what, that's just, what scares me. Right, so will right, it, will it just right. Russia complete? I mean, Ukraine completely collapse. What what does it mean? What happens to Ukraine? What happens? Yeah, yeah. well, it's a very it's going to be a very messy situation. Yeah, you know? It's going to be scary. You know, we've talked about this. It's, uh, there's going to be a moment of truth when it just becomes clear. You know when when the, the uh, when it no is no longer possible to hide. You know uh, uh, an imminent Russian victory. Like if they're the, the Russians are marching on Kiev, they take Kharkov, or you know you know they're marching on Odessa, something like that. You know, or they drive all the way to the Dnieper, or maybe even cross it. Some you know one of these. There's just not going to be a way to really downplay it, yeah, you know, or to spin it. I mean, even with like the recent, it's clear. And if you're if you're paying attention to mainstream media, there's a growing awareness. Yeah, that things are not going well for the Ukrainians. But if you're not paying very close attention, you know, again, I look through these Google news feeds, and you would think it's like the Ukrainians continue to do these amazing things, and the Russians are just a bunch of jackasses and whatever. Um, but there'll there'll be a point where they can't even do that anymore. And and there's just going to be a general hysteria, and who knows? You know, I again, I just don't seem to be dealing with very competent or rational people. Um, right. You know, I'd like to think that there are there are some competent, rational people in in these governments, um, and maybe they'll you know they'll win the day and uh, you know avert disaster. But who knows? It was, it's going to be scary because you know, they may feel like they have to uh, you know commit troops directly or. Well, can can we? I mean, technically, the United States is supposed to have a, a vote from Congress to declare war. We oh, haven't yeah, done. But, yeah, I know we haven't yeah. done that in a long time. But right. like since but, World I mean, War Two, right, right? But I mean, okay. Yeah. Every war since then has been kind of more minor wars. We're talking about a war with Russia here. Yeah. Right. Surely that has to go through Congress, right? Something that yeah, big. Oh, we can the president yeah. just start a war against well, Russia and well, nobody I mean, votes on it. Yeah. The fact is that all these wars have been illegal ever since. I, you know, I understand, and but I, this so, is this is I Russia we're big, talking right? about. You would hope so, but I just don't. You know, the, the Thomas Massey and Rand Paul, you know, will say that hey, we need to vote on this, and they may get a few, a handful of supporters, maybe from both sides of the aisle, but just a handful. And the rest of them, they're just, you know, they'll go along with whatever the president says. Well, that's just the, what it is now. I mean, that's just the reality in Congress. It, 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 okay, okay let's just say. There. Even if it did go to Congress, do you think that it would Congress would uh, are there enough neocons in Congress that they would vote for a war and say and say make an official declaration of war if it went to Congress? Well, yeah, no, no, because it's it's hard because to, right, maybe right. they want you know, to do again, it anyways. Because, right, they want the to make it is, official. Yeah, right, because it is that's the thing. I don't think they would want to vote on it. They want it to happen, and you know they they don't want to oppose the president and and you know all their, um, but it, it's got to be unpopular. You know I don't think there's going to be any support. Now I may be you know I may be proven wrong. There may be some kind of false flag or some way that the whole thing spun that people think oh we got to do this to save the Moldovans or something. I don't know. You know okay just because. <laughs> 
yeah. you know, you just remember like the outbreak of the the uh, the war in 2022. Um, there was a lot of hysteria, and there was a lot of um, you know Ukrainian flag waving in in America and small towns, and there, um, and that's pretty much died away. Actually, right around the corner, there's still one Ukrainian flag right around the corner from here, but um, but that's that's really rare. You know, it's, that's the only one that I've seen for a long time. Um, <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I think, you know, the polls have showed too, it's just that, yeah, no, nobody's interested in actually fighting with Russia. Um, but again, it's like the U S has a, a history of manufacturing incidents and equipping up war hysteria, the start wars, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, you know, the sinking of the main and whatever it's been going on for a long time. So there may be, they may have something up their sleeves, but it's it's going to be a challenge. You know, again, this is this is Russia, and people understand right away this is a possibility. They should understand anyway, as a possibility of it going nuclear. And I, you know, so there's maybe maybe it's just a lack of popular support. We'll put the brakes on it, and then an awareness Over. of you know of our fundamental weakness. You know, this may be not something that that's going to be spoken about openly. You know, but we talked about this in connection with Iran. It's that, you know, there's always this pressure to attack Iran and launch, you know, to you know, bomb Iran and whatever. And we've come close to it, but it's actually seems to be there's real resistance within the Pentagon. And I think it's because they, they understand something that the general public and the most of the Congress critters don't understand. You know, it's just that... Um, yeah, that that Iran actually can do real, real serious damage to, uh, you know, the American military bases in the Middle East, um, and it may be the same thing with the Russia. It's like when you get that close and there's a history or whatever, it's the Pentagon say, you know, actually we don't really have the ground forces to oppose them, right? <laughs> and it's and it, it would actually look really bad if we. You know, it's going to look a lot worse than it looks right now if we just say, okay, we're 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 just going to not get involved. Well, it's going to look an awful lot worse if you actually commit troops and you know and they're defeated. So let's not do it. That may happen, but right. it's just just hope and banking on you know a few sane heads here and there. Right. Well, you know, the West is always going on about how we need to preserve democracy and that Ukraine is a fight for democracy and defeating Trump is to save democracy. All this talk about democracy. Maybe if we're lucky, democracy will actually work and we will have peace because it's clear, like you said, that popular support for this project is bare bones. Right. If you look at the, the, the popularity of Western leaders, right. they're all down close to single digits now. They're down right, to like right, 20%. Right. Nobody right. likes them. So right. let's let's see. This will be a yeah. test. Are we yeah. truly in a democracy, and will we right. be able to get leaders that want to negotiate and yeah. talk and have a peaceful solution, right. or will we see that as they get increasingly desperate, as their numbers plummet, will they try to do everything in their power to start a war and seize more power and control it because they know that they're in a pickle of their own making? You know yeah. that. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting, right? It, there is there are signs, but like you say. Uh, I, you know, I think I mentioned that there was, a, you know, I saw a photo of all the, the G7 leaders and then with their, you know, approval ratings and they were negative all the way across, you know, deep, they're, they're all deeply underwater with the one exception. The one that was, wasn't doing too badly was Maloney, you know, from mm. Italy, who apparently again has been kind of drifting away uh, from support for Ukraine. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that shows yeah, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, these people are in trouble and there is a possibility of some kind of real shift in in uh, power in the West, um, I guess I again I've become cynical. You know, it seems like we've come close to that in the past, but they just have a way of co-opting or uh, you know you know maybe for example, well, first of all in, in the in the UK, yeah, there is deep deep dissatisfaction with the Conservative government there, and so Labour is probably going to win handily, and the, the, the Conservatives are just going to be uh, thoroughly routed. But the thing is that labor is just in, in the UK is virtually, you know, an identical twin of the conservatives. Nothing's really nothing's going to change there. Mm -hmm. um, now, in France, we could look at some real change. Right. Um, there's because uh, Marine Le Pen's party is is poised to win 
win big there. Um, the thing is, well, you know, they well, first of all, um, like she's become increasingly kind of establishment. She's she's described as far right, which is silly. You know, a lot of whatever these parties are called far right. Often they just have policies that would be considered centrist, like even just a couple of de decades ago, um, a generation ago. Um, but they're called far right now. And, uh, um, you know, that's true of um, of her party in France. Now, when she, if she, you know, she, so she's already made a lot of compromises on things like immigration and foreign policy. Um, but she still is, is an alternative. There's no question about it. You know, she said that we, you know, we need to um, negotiate with Russia, you know, that it's a mistake to these economic sanctions have been a mistake, things like that, you know. So maybe, maybe if if eventually she becomes elected, her party, you know, um, becomes the majority in the in the uh, the French um, Parliament. Um, I guess it's the National Assembly. The there will be a real shift in policy. But I I just kind of wonder just the power of the de-state, the establishment again and again, like you see even in this country when people who seem to be offering a different vision, like Trump in 2016, they become elected, elected, and when they get there, they amazingly end up doing the same thing. So we'll just have to see. And maybe this will be different. I, I think there's reasons to be at least hopeful in France that there will be a little shift, but we'll see. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Um, well, anything else you want to cover before we wrap it up? Uh, any updates yeah. on further updates on Ukraine or the Middle East? Um, yeah, I guess, let's see, I, I thought it would be interesting just to mention, um, I, I remember, I think it was a few episodes ago, you mentioned that, like, a, you had heard that an S-300 system had been hit and, mm. um, across the border, you know, from Kharkov, and I, I hadn't heard, but then later I did, it, actually coming from a, a, a Russian-leaning source, um, but I had, after that, I didn't see much about it. Um, and then there was a, a series of stories about like S-400 systems being hit in um, Crimea. And and some of those got a big play in Western media and in Taiwanese media that often is just, you know, a, a reflection of Western media. I, you know, I saw both in the, the Chinese version and the English version, but they, they had this, um, it looked like a Hollywood movie, you know, seeing this, it was supposed to be an S-400 system, you know, firing off these missiles and then getting hit and then and you, um, utterly destroyed, you know, I guess missing the the intended targets. And then the the, the, the S-400 launcher is, is just left us you know, with smoking ruin. And it, again, the thing looked like a Hollywood movie. I just think of that. I'm sorry, but that just can't be. I mean, like I see every time these things happen, the best you get is some sort of grainy satellite photo. You know, why would the Russians have like a, a film crew nearby and then release something that would not be to their advantage? So I don't know what was going on, but and both the story was always the same. It's like, wow, the S-400 was completely, you know, devastated by the attack. Ums. Boy, you know, um, Turkey and India, you know, these countries that have bought S-400s, they must be really worried now. Um, <laughs> so, it, you know, Maybe, maybe it, there was an, a lapse and an S four hundred was was destroyed, and and then the, and the Western powers decided to play it up, and they actually provided their own footage and gave it to, you know, gave it to these media outlets around the world and told them what the storyline is like. Again, India and Turkey it must be really upset now, <laughs> um, because we, we've talked about how important these air defense systems are and how, you know, the prestige of the the. Um, of the flagship American system, the Patriot system, took a real beating, you know, recently, uh, especially, you know, in Israel, where the, the Israelis announced that they were just going to mothball it because it wasn't, didn't do anything. Um, and that had to be a real blow. And you're just thinking, you know, what's the main competition? It's probably the S-400. So they're just saying, man, we better do something you know, to, 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 you know, protect our assets here. You know, again, it's, it's not just geopolitics it's also economics these things each one each patriot system is one point or a patriot battery is 1.1 billion dollars um and uh so i i just struck by that you know i saw those reports and the, the the s300 and 
the thing is, I don't pretend to know. I'm not saying, ah, now I know it's all phony. There, there's probably some truth to it. Like some of these, maybe the S300 was really hit. Maybe the S400 was damaged. You know, maybe one actually was destroyed. I, I don't know. But it seems clear to me that there was a, a deliberate effort to play it up. And, you know, it's part of this war of, uh, you know, of uh, air defense systems that's going mm -hmm. on. That's kind of, uh, it, which is, is kind of taking place in addition to the real wars that are being fought. Yeah, that's silly, though. I mean, the, the countries that they're trying to woo, like, let's say, India or Turkey or Saudi Arabia, yeah. we've lost them. They're gone. You know, oh. there's no, no coming back now. I mean, the only people that maybe we can get to continue yeah, to well, buy our stuff. Yeah. I mean, India know. has always been rather independent. And actually, India and Turkey, they both have been. I mean, Turkey is, has a tendency to always, you know, play both sides. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. But we are definitely worried about India. I think that there's there has been a shift towards Russia. You know, you know they're, they're never going to go completely become allies. That's, I think, it's been a real um, sort of a integral part of their foreign policy is, is neutrality, non-alignment. And that, that's been mm -hmm. true for many decades and it will continue it's, to be true. It's a good policy to have. Yeah, you know? no, it is. Like it is. It's, it's something, I think, a policy that every country should adopt. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, right. it's, it's, it right. just makes sense. And the Russians sense. don't have a problem with it. You know, it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, you, you do business with whoever you want to, but it's, it's there's only one group of people. Yeah. It's the so-called rules-based order. It's the U.S. and its, you know, its close allies that do not mm -hmm. like non-alignment. You know, it's like right. you're with us or against us. And, and right. if you start yeah. doing business with the other side, we'll punish you. Right. <laughs> that, that's that's the game that we thought we're playing. And yeah. that's all, everything we're doing is for that. You Either you're in our club or you're the enemy. Um, and it's yeah. just not, it's not a good game to play. It's not going to end out, you know, end up well for us. Um, yeah, it's just fascinating times. I can't believe the world we live in. You know, it's just so crazy. And having someone like Biden at the helm with Trump, you know, <laughs> right. and, you know, mug <laughs> shots. Wings, and, right, and, right, yeah. It's just, and, and what's happening in Israel and Russia and just, it's, it's all just, it's a madhouse. And to, so many people just don't care. <laughs> it's yeah. not interested. Actually, I just yeah, don't uh, understand. Right. On, on, that, on that subject, I found this very interesting. There was a poll that came out recently from Russia. It was a poll conduct, conducted within Russia, and it found that 57% of the population in Russia believes that World War III could break out in the next five to 10 years. Hmm. Okay, now, could doesn't mean, you know, it, um, that it will. But it, there are people will, are aware there, of it. But there's a realistic yeah. possibility, enough that you ought to be worried about it. Hmm. And so that's 50, and only 13% thought, oh, it couldn't happen. I bet it would very likely be the completely reverse here. I mean, there's there's an awareness of what's going on. And I, I think here people are, are insulated to a great extent. They just don't understand and uh, they should, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we're helping people understand bit by bit. Okay, all right, then um, I think we can end it there. Thanks okay. a lot, Dad.